Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to CSIS. My name is Andy Cutchins, and I'm director of the Russia and Eurasia program here, and uh, very pleased to be chairing what is the, the second half of our double header, so to speak, uh, discussing energy issues in uh, Central Asia and South Asia, and uh, some very promising and exciting projects to bring energy regional connectivity uh, between the two uh, two areas and sets, sets of countries. Yesterday, uh, we put uh, more focus on the discussion of the TAPI, TAPI pipeline, and today we're going to be discussing in much greater depth the two-tap interconnection concept and CASA 1000 projects. Um, the two-tap, I love that acronym, reminds me of a band back in the 1980s called Aztec Two-Step for some reason. Um, two-tap, of course, stands for Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Got it. Pretty good. Pakistan, <laughs> Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, backwards. Uh, and uh, this is a project which is uh, uh, um, initiated by the Asian Development Bank. And the CASA 1000 project uh, is a project, of course, initiated by the World Bank. So we're delighted to have representatives from both the Asian Development Bank and the World Bank here today. Uh, along with uh, Fatima Sumar, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Bureau of South and Central Asian Affairs. Welcome here to CSIS. Um, there's been a, a slight, uh, some changes in, in the program. Uh, we thought we would improve the program. We weren't satisfied with those who were initially listed. I'm just kidding about that. <laughs> <coughs> I want that to get back to, uh, to Rune and to uh, Ranjit. But, uh, uh, speaking first uh, will be uh, Jim Liston uh, from the Asian Development Bank, who's uh, the principal energy specialist in the energy division uh, at uh, the Central and West Asia Department of the ADB. And uh, following Jim from the World Bank will be uh, Julia Bucknell, uh, who is the manager for uh, energy in the South Asia region at the World Bank. Delighted to have Julia with us. And then uh, discussing uh, and kind of putting the whole package together, I think, will be uh, uh, Fatima Sumar, uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, for uh, South and Central Asian Affairs at the Department of State. So with uh, no further ado, let me turn the floor over to Jim and let's rock and roll. Thank you, Andy. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining our talk this morning. I'll speak for maybe about 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And actually, we have, even though the logo here says ADB, in fact, the subject we're talking about is a joint topic between World Bank and ADB. And in fact, when it comes to the CASA portion, uh, Julie will, will step up. So you can view this presentation really as a joint um, uh, deck from, from, from both our organizations. So if, without further ado, <coughs> uh, let's just put the, um, the project and the location into some geographic context. Um, for those of you who are not aware, um, the region we're talking about, Central Asia, is comprised of uh, five countries, Central Asian Republics, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyz Republic, and Kazakhstan. In south of this region, up in the north, we have, of course, Afghanistan and Pakistan. So when we talk about electrical connectivity between Central Asia and South Asia, at this stage, the initial stage of development is actually linking Central Asia to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Now, <clears throat> and why are we linking Central Asia to Pakistan? Well, first of all, Central Asia is, enjoys tremendous energy resources, way in, in excess of its needs. You've got the three uh, downstream um, countries, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan been immensely rich in fossil fuels. Turkmenistan is the fourth 
largest gas or uh, 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 possesses the fourth largest gas reserves in in the world. Uzbekistan uh, is rich in coal and gas, and Kazakhstan is rich in all resources. The figures are quoted here in terms of million tons of oil equivalent. And upstream, and I use the word upstream because these countries are linked through two rivers, the Amadaria and the Sirdaria. And upstream, you have two smaller countries, Kyrgyz Republic and Tajikistan. And these two smaller countries are rich in hydro resources. So we've got a hydro and thermal rich uh, area, uh, all wishing to, to use this natural resource and export energy. Now, <clears throat> during the Soviet era, the, um, the, the planners uh, capitalized on this hydrothermal uh, uh, split between the, the countries. <clears throat> And they constructed large dams to, uh, to store the water in Kyrgyz Republic and Tajikistan so uh, that the water was, was stored and released during summer uh, down the Amadaria and the Sirdaria to provide a, an irrigation source for the, um, the crops uh, in the three downstream countries. Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and uh, um, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. <coughs> now, wh when you release water, of course, you can generate electricity. So they had turbines to generate electricity, but the demand in the upstream countries during summer was, was low. So when they released water, they generated electricity, and the electricity was at that time exported to the downstream countries who then did not use their fossil fuel resources to generate electricity. And in, in return, in winter, when the upstream countries were actually in deficit, the downstream countries would send the electricity back, and now which was now generated from gas and coal. A very, a very fine arrangement. A uh, good example of uh, Soviet central planning. And to make all this happen, they constructed this, this immense grid. You can see there the, uh, the network. This was a 500 kV network, big, big uh, investment. And uh, a, an example of Soviet attention to, uh, to in infrastructure. Now, so with the collapse of the Soviet Union, unfortunately for the countries involved, this, this uh, centralized planning regime also collapsed. The, um, the countries now, rather than getting involved in a summer-winter energy exchange, they now adopted a, an energy independence and, uh, uh, model approach. So you can see there that the, um, in 1998, the volume of energy that, uh, that flowed between these countries was what, 25,000 gigawatt hours. That's quite a, a reasonable figure. But by the time it came to 2008, that 25,000 had almost disappeared to what, 3,000, 3, 3,700 gigawatt hours. Trade had, had largely, largely collapsed. <clears throat> also, the countries, the um, the 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 countries that had been connected through this this 500 kV grid that I mentioned, which is called the Central Asian Power System, it's they started to uh, to withdraw from from this system. So Turkmenistan <coughs> withdrew in 2003. It now is electrically connected with Iran, so it's no longer in the, in the CAPS, the Central Asian Power System. And today, Tajikistan is also not connected to CAPS and indeed is an electric island. It is operating on its own. 
So today, uh, instead of a, an integrated, interconnected uh, network of five countries, you have one is gone and now connected with Iran, one is on its own, and the remaining three, for now, remain interconnected, and there is some modest trade between those three, three countries. I'm giving you this background because this is relevant to the two projects that we will be presenting now, uh, the Council 1000 and the uh, TUTAP. Now, <clears throat> so in the north, we have all this energy-rich resources, <clears throat> but the story in the south is quite different. So in Afghanistan, we've got a, a sizable country. It's the size of Texas. Its population is 40th in the world. It's a, it's a substantial country. But it's, well, yesterday I spoke about Afghanistan. I, I can just say that we shouldn't be looking at all the negatives that from 2003, when the, when the donors, the international community uh, became involved, the electrification rate has risen from 7.5% in 2003 to 30% today. <coughs> And that's a substantial achievement, and we all read uh, negative stories about the effectiveness of donors in, um, in Afghanistan. But in fact, we can be proud of that sizable achievement. That's what, nearly 10 million people are thereabouts um, who have access to electricity, uh, which did not have before. So that's a but nevertheless, that leaves 70%, which is 20 million, who are in darkness, and that's a problem. <coughs> so they, <coughs> their energy consumption is low, and I'll explain in a, briefly in a moment with the plans on, on Afghanistan. <coughs> in, in Pakistan, again, we've got a, a very significant country, 180 million. We've got a higher electrification rate of 67%, 70%, but still 30% are not electrified. And so you have a, a sizable uh, uh, population, again, uh, with, no, with no supply. And indeed, the population who do have supply do not get that supply year, year round. So they have a shortage. For those who are connected, they, they, there's a, a 5,000 5, megawatt uh, capacity shortfall between, between supply and, and demand. So these two countries are in uh, energy deficit. They need supply. So there's a, a great opportunity here to link energy-rich countries who have access to d these two energy deficit countries. I think this sums it up there. We've got the four countries, energy rich, and we've got power poor, Pakistan and Afghanistan. So the concept to link Central Asia to, to South Asia, initially those two countries is called Kasserim. Central Asia, uh, South Asia, regional electricity market. That's an umbrella concept. Uh, that the donors are working on to achieve this connectivity. Now, we've got two initiatives, uh, two CASRM initiatives. I will speak about the TUTAP uh, initiative, and Julie will follow me to speak about the, the, um, the CASA 1000 initiative. TUTAP is an acronym. And of course, all projects need a, a name, and uh, this project is no different. It's uh, TUTAP comes from the the uh, the name of the immediately connected countries: Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. And uh, this diagram here uh, shows the. The, how the, the three immediately uh, adjacent northern countries will be connected to Afghanistan and how Afghanistan can, uh, can connect to Pakistan. 
and I can show you in some detail here. Now, today in, in Afghanistan, you have actually, you do not have a grid system. You have a, a multi-island network. In fact, you have 10 separate electrical networks. Now, part of the reason why you have 10 separate networks is because the neighboring countries which are supplying power, 70% of its energy needs are supplied by imports, and they come from Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan. And because these countries themselves are no longer interconnected, as I mentioned in the previous slides, Therefore, when they come to Afghanistan, they cannot be just connected together. You cannot take electricity from different systems and just pool it together. This is not, uh, not possible. So you, this results in different electrical areas from each of the imports. Plus then you have local generation in, uh, in Afghanistan. They have some hydro resources. Their capacity, their domestic capacity is modest. Following the 30-year um, the war, before the, the donors uh, resumed in the 2000s, maybe about 500 megawatts, so of which about half is, is hydro, summer-only power. And the donors, the initial response was to, to put in emergency generation and to uh, construct these import needs being the fastest way to, to get uh, supply. So ADB uh, commissioned a, a study of the Afghan uh, power sector, a master plan study. What should be done in, in Afghanistan? So on the right, you have the, the findings of the study. It's available on the website. For those of you with the energy to read the 1,000-page report, you can get all the details of how we go from there to there but I'll try to su summarize it for you and say that by 2032, for the, uh, the plan is to interconnect all these islands. And this is what is done throughout the whole world. Every utility, every country, bar only Afghanistan, has adopted this approach because of economies of scale. Now you can have bigger power plants, which are cheaper per unit, and you transmit this to your population. So that's the first recommendation of the, of the um, master plan. The master plan has done a demand forecast, which identifies that the Afghan demand will increase fivefold from uh, today. And after coming, after increasing uh, fivefold, it will then reach the energy consumption, electric energy consumption per capita of today's India and Pakistan. So we're not talking about huge or unrealistic uh, growth. We're talking about um, uh, real, r reasonable expectation for the, for the population of Afghanistan. And how do you supply that? You supply it, of course, by building uh, power plants in, in Afghanistan, but this will take some time. This will take some years. And in the meantime, while you're building your power plants, your coal, your gas, your hydro power plants, all of which are being uh, developed either by the private sector or under assistance from the donor, while you're waiting to build these domestic plants, you continue on imports. And imports will, uh, to date, are 70% of electricity supply, and by 2032, <coughs> imports will have dropped to 33%. So that's the, um, now, because, just a minor digression here on, for the technically minded among you, the, um, because the, the imports are coming from three separate systems, uh, and they can't just simply be added together, uh, there is a technical solution. And what you do is you convert the import from AC to DC to AC. It's called a back-to-back -back converter, and such approaches are standard practice worldwide. Japan has two systems, a different frequency, they have back-to-back -back converters. 
India's export to Bangladesh is through a back-to-back -back converter. Um, a recently commissioned uh, converter in Georgia to export to Turkey is through a back-to-back -back converter. And indeed, here in America, you, you do not have a, inter a fully interconnected system. You have three. You have the Eastern Interconnect, the Western Interconnect, and Texas. And there is a project, Tres Amigos, to interconnect, to allow trade between those three networks through a back-to-back -back converter. The proposal is to construct a hub in the north of Afghanistan, which will be a back-to-back -back converter. And the countries will connect here, and the output of this will feed to the Afghan system. Now, so th this is all very good. And while doing this study and identifying this opportunity, it was then that the strategic location of Afghanistan, the, the opportunity for Afghanistan to, to benefit and be the Silk Road between Central Asia and Pakistan and use this grid that is being constructed in any case for Afghans' domestic need and to use this to wheel power from energy-rich Central Asia to uh, energy-poor Pakistan. And so that's, uh, which is basically the origins of the two-tap concept. Now, where are we at on, on this particular project? So here is a, a map showing the existing, the, the situation today in, in Afghanistan. You have, um, to the left, you have supply coming from Iran. In the top left, you have supply coming from Turkmenistan. In the top, you have a supply coming from Uzbekistan and top right is the supply coming from Tajikistan. Actually, of, of those interconnections, the majority, um, the Afghans demand today is about uh, three and three and a half thousand gigawatt hours, of which maybe about 2,200 is imports, of which the majority, 60% of that is coming from Uzbekistan, which has produced, which has resulted in uh, 24 hour electricity in Kabul um, today, which is quite an achievement, but there's a, 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 um, a supply gap pending. So what's happening? Um, first of all, the connection with Turkmenistan. Uh, Turkmenistan uh, is very rich in uh, gas. It uh, separately wishes to, does, and wishes to expand its gas exports. But it also has a policy to use this gas to convert the gas to electricity and therefore diversify its, its, uh, its exports, its energy exports, export its gas by gas and gas by electricity. So a line, a transmission line from Turkmenistan to the northwest of Afghanistan is today under construction. In fact, the line to the border in Turkmenistan is completed is existing, and the line from the border to the northwest region is being financed by ADB, and the, uh, the bids have been received, and the contracts are hoped to be awarded in the next few months. Now, this year, ADB plans to bring to its board a, a, um, an extension of the interconnection with Turkmenistan. You can see now that the, the connection with Turkmenistan, in fact, continues down to the central hub, Polycomri, where we will have this back-to-back -back converter station that I mentioned. And it will include the first back-to-back -back converter. Then from Polycomri down to Kabul, which is a, is, a, um, is a route passing through Salang Pass, quite a famous route. And there is a, a line, a 500 kV line, again, a high capacity line under construction, today being, being financed again by, by Asian Development Bank. And then, of course, uh, SEPs to NEPs. In the northern region, it's called the, the northeastern power system. In the south, you have the, uh, the southeastern uh, 
power system and to connect to those together. And that will, is planned to be, to be processed by uh, ADB for financing next year. So in fact, by once these contracts are awarded and constructed, you will have a high capacity link with uh, Turkmenistan. You will have a, which is what, maybe 1,000 megawatts. You will have a, a 400 megawatt link existing with Uzbekistan, a 600 megawatt link existing with Tajikistan, a 2,000 megawatt link from, from Pulikamri to, to Kabul under construction. In fact, TUTAP is not a vision, that is a vision, but it's not a dream. It's, in fact, under implementation right now. By 2018, 2019, these three countries will have come to Kabul, will have uh, the capacity to supply down to Kabul, and indeed, for a very modest extension from Kabul to Pakistan, 400 kilometers, maybe $200 million, you can connect the three countries to, to Pakistan. So this is the concept of, of TUTAP. It's under implementation, and uh, that's where we are. This is, that's far too much, I guess. That's, uh, I won't go through that, but that is what the, that is, that, that's what the Afghan system will look like in 2032, but I certainly won't go through that with you. And how do I click on? Now, I will now pass over to Julie, who will speak on CASA, and then we can wrap up to show how the two actually match together. Thank you. So the, the CASA project is something that really takes advantage of, of, of a, a huge need and a sort of wasted resource and tries to link the two together. So I'm sure most people in this room know that energy in Pakistan is a huge crisis. I mean, it's a huge opportunity cost for the economy. Uh, it's also a huge cost in terms of poverty reduction and, and sort of dignity for, most, for many people in the country. Um, and so they have a desperate need for generation. The current generation is dependent on extremely expensive um, fuels. Uh, um, so there is also a need to change the fuel mix for, for Pakistan. And, the, and then there's these hydropower assets already existing, which have to release the water because of the downstream needs for irrigation that Jim mentioned, but don't generate in the summer because they don't need the power in the summer because they need the power in the winter for heating. Um, so at the moment, there's water passing through dams, which, is not, which could generate power and isn't generating power in the north. And in the south, where the peak demand is in the summer, there's a huge deficit, right? 18 hours a day, or you know, 10 to 12 hours a day load shedding, sometimes more in, in the summer. So basically, you know, you can, from the outside, and if, 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 if you were a Martian, you would say this is a crazy, um, a crazy situation. And so what we've done is be those Martians and try and link those things together. So that, it's, a, it's quite a simple concept, in, in conceptually very simple. Obviously, in terms of implementation, much more complicated. So. It's about a billion dollars worth of investment split between um, the four countries. And basically, it's taking, uh, I mean, you can see the map. It's taking an AC line ac basically across Kyrgyz Republic into Tajikistan um, and then convert doing another one of those conversions, uh, DC, uh, AC to DC, um, and then a, a long 750-kilometer uh, transmission line um, through Afghanistan into Peshawar in Pakistan. Um, so it's, it's, as I said, conceptually quite a simple project. Um, it's, it's about, as I said, about a billion dollars. Um, about half of that financing is coming from the World Bank, and that was approved a few months ago by our board. And so um, we started, even started the procurement of some of the, um, of some of the infrastructure, and the other, rest of the, we're working on getting the rest of the financing. Um, well, our, our clients are working on getting the rest of the financing with our help. Um, we think it'll start operating in 2018. And I just want to point out wh what a large amount of power this is. It's, it's going to be about 7% of Pakistan's total power consumption 
but it, only in the summer months. So in those summer months, it'll be a much higher percentage. So uh, you know, the, the five terawatt hours per year is actually a really large amount of power. So we're really, um, I mean, it's really exciting for, I think, all of our countries to have been able to get this far and um, to be able to link it into a much larger plan for the whole region is absolutely the, the vision. And you know, this is one part of that contribution towards that vision. Jim's going to talk now about how this, all these two different things linked together. Um, but you know, we're just, I just wanted to point out that this is a thing that's now ongoing. It's not, no longer a dream, it's beca becoming a reality. Thank you. So it truly is a two-step. There you go, yeah, two-step. <laughs> so thank you, Julie. Now, <clears throat> uh, just a two slides, so it's, uh, your, your patience is uh, appreciated. So this is the uh, schematic. All as engineers, I'm an engineer like schematics, and uh, it shows the um, the connection from the the existing connections, the existing operational connections from Kyrgyz, Uzbek. It shows the the connection from Turkmenistan uh, under construction, and it shows the next phase, which is due for ADB board approval this year, feeding into the Polycomery hub then connecting down uh, with the connection down to Kabul under construction, and the possible connection to Peshawar. Now, there you've got the Castle 1000. And the Castle 1000, these two concepts actually are different, right? One is to supply Afghans' needs, and then the surplus can be exported, whereas CASA is an interregional concept to take advantage of the enormous summer surplus and largely transmit the majority of that to, to Pakistan. So there are two different concepts, but they can complement each other. And indeed, there is connection to Kabul from the CASA project, which in fact could mean that the connection from Kabul to to Pakistan from Afghanistan can be through that system. So in fact, the surplus supply in, in um, Afghanistan can be through the CASA system to, to Pakistan. Indeed, the surplus can be back up to Tajikistan, which is in winter energy deficit. So there is flexibility between these two, two projects. So, last slide. So just to, to, uh, to, to emphasize, the two concepts are different. So CASA maximizes inter-regional trade. It takes the summer surplus and supplies that to Pakistan, which is in uh, deficit, peak, peak deficit during its summer period, whereas TUTAP meets Afghans' needs with the opportunity to export that. The, to export the, the surplus can be year-round because of the thermal nature of the supply from Turkmenistan. The Afghan master plan, the 1,000 document, 1,000 page document that I know you will all be reading tonight, it's your homework, and this, in fact, is being updated right now. The uh, consultant, Fickner of Germany, which prepared the original document, is now revising this document to, uh, to, uh, re to update the generation uh, forecast to, m to match in with the supply that can come from uh, CASA and then to, to, um, to produce a, a, a updated report. World Bank, who are, um, who are championing the uh, CASA and ADB, who are championing TUTAP, will then ensure that the two projects are coordinated in terms of technical solution, the scheduling so that the timing works, and of course the commercial nature because all of these projects are, are linked into export prices and import prices and charges. So I think that brings us to an end, and thank you. Uh, well, Jim and Julia, thank you very much for uh, outlining TUTAP and, and CASA. These are really exciting projects. Uh, my colleague uh, Jeff Mankoff and I, uh, just last month in our trip to uh, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan, 
uh, in Turkmenistan, we had a meeting at the, uh, the Ministry of Energy, uh, which is all about power generation. And it was very impressive to learn uh, what they had done in the last uh, 15 or 20 years and what they are planning, planning to do uh, and in the context of this project to bring a significantly increased amount of, amounts of electricity to the border for transmission uh, across. Now, let's turn to, uh, to Fatima, Fatima Sumar, as uh, this work is, uh, I think, intricate to the uh, Obama administration's uh, plans for the region to develop uh, greater connectivity and uh, regional dependencies and to bring power to the people. Okay. Andy, thank you so much. I'm really thrilled to be here, and um, it's a real honor to be up here with Jim and Julia, and I really want to thank CSIS for putting on this event because it's so timely with, um, in the wake of the announcements on Afghanistan lately from the president, um, planning with uh, underway that's um, going on in the transition, issues in Ukraine, which I think also factor into this conversation in terms of energy, indep energy independence. I wanted to just take a moment before I talk directly about Casa and Tutap to put this in a larger political context. So uh, folks here understand both the, the importance of this work and really the planning for the future that's taking place with countries in this region. And the first thing I just wanted to put into context here is there's been so much conversation <clears throat> in terms of the transition in Afghanistan and what the U.S. role is going to look like in this region. And I think one of the things, with the, and there's been a lot of support with, from the United States for the Casa Rem project and the Casa Rem initiative and Casa 1000 and, and TUTAP, and one of the things that you know, we are planning on from in the State Department and the Obama administration is really the sense of what this region looks like as a much more interconnected, economically uh, dependent region, uh, even with the drawdown and transition in Afghanistan. And what's really striking to us is there's such a hunger and need when you talk to governments in this region, civil society, businesses, the private sector, for looking at a region that's not just trapped by its geography, but that can actually unleash the potential of cooperating more with its neighbors when it looks at greater economic connections. And this is really at the heart of what the United States has been promoting in cooperation with countries in the region of our New Silk Road initiative. And it's not just a vision. I really want to use the word initiative very carefully here, because it's a very carefully thought out project, a series of projects and plans very much developed in conversation with countries in the region looking at their needs and looking at the kinds of opportunities that countries are looking towards when it looks at different parts of its geography. So let me be a little bit more specific. When you look at the region and you look at the countries of Central Asia, the five Central Asian countries, and they, you look at their uh, neighborhood in terms of their relationship with Afghanistan, you look at the neighborhood with Pakistan, and then getting down to the Indian subcontinent. Traditionally, most of the trade and transit routes go east-west. And what we are seeing today is not a displacement of those routes. They will continue to dominate the economies. They will continue to dominate trade and transit opportunities. But looking for additional opportunities, both on the trade, transit, and energy side, that with these new north-south connections that can really complement what we're seeing in the region. This is the least integra integrated region in the world. So we have less than 5% of intra-regional flows in the Central South Asia region and less than 1% of intra-investment flows. The challenges for these economies are really great. And what we're seeing today is a real desire and push to need to build capacity, need to build connections. And this is where this collective effort has come in with the international community. And I really want to compliment the leadership of both the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank that have been helping uh, really drive a, a new vision and helping all of us kind of organize around certain projects and areas. From in the United States, we have talked a lot about the new Silk Road project, uh, project series of projects. There's four areas that we are really looking at when you look at the 2014 to 2016 period. The first is creating a regional energy market, which is exactly consistent with the presentation Jim and Julie gave today of creating a Casarema, South Asia, Central Asia regional energy market. And I'll come back to that in a moment. The second is facilitating trade and transit routes that can really help make the kind of connections that you need in this region. That's looking at WTO accession, that's looking at trade cross-border trade and transit agreements, the trade infrastructure and architecture it takes so that you can actually streamline um, the cost of doing business in the region and actually make sure that goods can flow from one across one border to another. 
The third is streamlining customs and borders. And here we're really looking at what are the costs of doing business and how do you reduce the costs for truckers that are moving goods across borders? How do you streamline opera operations? How do you actually make sure that you're moving towards this goal of open but secure borders in the region so that you can take into account both the security concerns, which are legitimate that all the states have in terms of securing their borders, but not at the expense of facilitating greater transit and trade, both of goods and of people and ideas. And the fourth is really connecting people to people and expanding market opportunity and market access. And here, we've really played, I think, a pivotal role in helping connect businesses across the region. Um, we've had monthly trade fairs throughout the region, in Islamabad, in uh, Mazari Sharif, in Kabul, in other places, where businesses from across the region, Kazakh businesses, Uzbek businesses, Afghan businesses, Pakistanis, can come together and they sign letters of intent on the spot in one fair. In Mazar, for instance, we had eight to ten million dollars worth of letters of um, intent generated during these types of um, during these types of fairs. And it's the first time that you're seeing businesses actually create new kind of markets and opportunities in, in ways that are, are very exciting. There's already a lot of change that's come about in the region, and I think I really want to underscore the, the point that Jim left us with, which is a lot is already happening on the ground. So these are not just plans for the next 10, 20 years in terms of the planning phase, but we're already in project implementation phase, and I think there's some real successes that I want to highlight for us to kind of take away. First is um, the average cost of crossing borders in this region. It's, it's pretty dramatic. It's gone down almost 15% in the last three years. And given how difficult border crossings, and any of you that have been to this region know this firsthand, can be in this region, that's quite significant. If you look at the volume of intra-regional trade, it's increased almost 49% in the last five years in this, in this greater region. Again, a huge accomplishment. And the third piece, which is a Jim that, uh, point that Jim said that I just want to underscore again, is looking at rates of electrification. Afghanistan alone, the fact that you can go from um, a rate of 5 percent in 2002 to over 30 percent today is really quite significant and shows you that there's something different going on here in terms of the collective effort of countries and the international community in this region. Coming back to the first point on the regional energy market and, and the CASA two-tap pieces, the United States has been very supportive of these projects. We've worked very closely with the World Bank, with the Asian Development Bank. On CASA, we made a $15 million announcement of um, a contribution back in December. And we do that because we really do believe that the future of energy trade in this market can be, very tra can be transformational. For the first time in this region, you're having conversations, if you go to India, if you go to Pakistan, where governments and private sector companies and energy companies are actually thinking about how do they tap into their vast energy needs by importing from energy-rich Central Asia. That's not a conversation you'd had a year ago or two years ago or five years ago in any kind of serious way. And these are the kind of conversations that are taking place today. On CASA in particular, we've worked very closely um, with the CASA Secretariat, which, the, which USAID has been um, supporting for, for many years now. The CASA Secretariat has been instrumental in bringing all four CASA countries together, looking at the different project agreements that need to take to place, looking at the pretty aggressive deadlines in terms of the pro um, project agreements that have been set out and how countries can meet it. One of the things that really strikes me in the kind of work that we're doing on CASA and on TUTAP, it, you know, when you look at CASA, for instance, it's not just a conversation about energy and electricity. It's actually a conversation that, for the first time, in, in a really significant way, brings together the four countries to negotiate, to negotiate on a joint future of what that could look like. And every series of um, monthly discussions that are taking place, whether they're taking place by DVCs or VTCs on video or telephone, whether they're taking place in Istanbul or in Washington, D.C. or Ramadi, is building greater trust between the four negotiating parties, between the four countries, getting to know each other, getting to know different negotiation styles, cultural styles, and really exploring what the possibilities are in terms of this. And I think for all of us in this room and in, throughout that have been working on these projects, what's really struck us is that this is bigger than electricity. It's bigger than energy. It's about, it's about actually looking at ways that these countries that have never really worked together in any kind of fundamental projects, as complicated as these are, and I underscore how complicated these projects are. Progress is not necessarily linear. You make pro uh, progress on some project agreements, and then you move backwards on pricing or on something, or, you know, another issue. But the idea is moving and working towards something that's a collective goal. Now. To get to, to get to the finish line on both these projects, I think there's a lot of things that need to happen that I wanted to just lay out here today. 
The first, and I'm actually, I can't underscore how um, thrilled we are to A, not just do this presentation up here collectively today, but for the real work that has taken place within the World Bank and the ADB to work together towards complementarity of these projects. Because too often, um, in, in complex areas where we work, in Afghanistan and Pakistan and elsewhere, big donors can come in, get very wrapped up in their own projects, and fail to see the bigger project of how this leaves behind a broader legacy for these countries who then have to deal with the consequences for their energy markets, for their pricing, and for other issues. But there's a real commitment underway from both banks to work towards joint complementarity on these projects to make sure that these um, projects are working in tandem, um, both for uh, eventually bringing energy flows into Pakistan, but also in terms of the broader Afghanistan National Energy Plan, which is very significant in terms of the investments from the donor community over the past decade or so. Another challenge to look at is domestic energy needs in each of these countries, including in Central Asia. You know, Central Asia, like even uh, like its uh, counterparts in Afghanistan and Pakistan, even though it has significant energy uh, potential in terms of export, it has significant domestic energy challenges as well. This is a grid that needs significant upgrades, modernization, that has lagged behind in many ways since the collapse of the former Soviet Union. You have brownouts that occur daily in some places. Uh, with the winter energy crises in places like Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan is quite severe. And so as we, work, uh, as we work towards these types of projects that can really explore what export markets can look like to build up generation and revenue capacities in the Central Asian countries, it also needs to be done in a way that really looks at domestic energy uh, issues within these countries as well. And I'm very pleased that both the World Bank and the ADB have significant in, uh, investments and um, conversations that are underway right now to look at the domestic energy needs in these countries. And that's, and that's an area of real focus, I think, for the United States and other countries. Another challenge, of course, is the, geop the geopolitics of the region in terms of this is one of the uh, most exciting regions in the world. If you look at its neighborhood, if you look at the Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians, um, of course, the security situation in Afghanistan. And so there will be significant geopolitical issues that will need to be worked out so that all countries understand what their roles and responsibilities are to support these types of energy markets and grids. It's creating a new type of momentum, which can be uh, challenging at times for these countries to negotiate and to handle. Uh, one of the things that we have been working towards in, from the Obama administration and the State Department has been really being as transparent as possible in terms of both the New Silk Road initiative and the kind of work we're doing, but also in the conversations we're having in the region with what it's going to take for these countries to really m match up their energy grids and, and making sure that the, for those countries that do have concerns about what this means in terms of export potential, for what countries um, that have concerns about uh, uh, resource water sharing, transboundary water issues, which are another challenge for this region. Um, that these concerns are being addressed in a way that are transparent and that bring countries together. The last thing we want to do is exacerbate regional tensions, especially over water sharing issues, which can be very, very politically difficult in this region. And so it has to be done in a way that, um, mac that maximizes the pie for all the countries in the region, whether or not they're direct um, participants of these, of these projects. Um, and the last thing I just want to end with is that there's a real, I think, sense of moment of opportunity here as we think about what is happening in this region. And one of the things that really strikes me, I've been on the road, you know, about seven, ten days a month on, on a lot of these types of issues throughout Central Asia and South Asia. You know, the conversations we're having here now on the Central Asia side of how to connect are actually building momentum on the South Asia side. So I was just in India and Bangladesh, for instance, and there's this renewed sense of urgency and momentum even in the South Asia context on energy, on, on energy security and, and how to build regional energy grids. And they're looking to see what's happening here. And, you know, it's, I think we are all kind of struck. We are in India, we've been in India, our, our teams over the last few months, and folks there are talking about CASA 1000 and thinking about, hey, can we be part of that? Or can, is there a way for us to be getting energy as well from Central Asia? Whether it's TAPI, wh whether it's gas, whether it's electricity, what are the different ways of doing that? What should we be doing here in the, Central, in the South Asia context to also create our own regional energy grid that one day could connect? Uh, what would it take to build the lines between India and Pakistan for these conversations to happen and really connect up into Central Asia as well? So it's a moment of real opportunity. 
um, the window does not necessarily last indefinitely. And so there is a sense of urgency for all the countries to really work together, finalize um, pricing deals, finalize the commercial and project agreements, um, take the steps to show ongoing momentum, to build confidence within the donor community, and, and show that there's something really happening here. But I think we're, you know, we're really seized with a sense of opportunity, of, of excitement, that there's some real collaboration and, and um, a sense of a sense of real opportunity here if, if all these different pieces come together. Thanks. That was super. <clears throat> I am really excited about this, and I'll and I'll tell you why. I'll put in a little bit of historical context. Uh, hearing about the uh, the collaboration going on between the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank, and especially how the Obama administration has taken leadership on the new Silk Road initiative uh, and developing not just developing, but actually getting to the finish line on some concrete projects which are going to re leave a real legacy in the region uh, and a unique legacy in the region. Um, I don't need to tell everybody that, of course, uh, you know, the end of 20, 2014, our troop presence, uh, are, we are in principle no longer to be fighting in Afghanistan, advising and training instead. And uh, we know the President announced that a full troop uh, departure by, by 2016. But, you know, for an old Sovietologist like me, uh, who one of the first things you learned about what is Soviet power? Socialism plus electrification of the countryside. I mean, electrification of the country is just so fundamentally important for any, any state. It, could just, and it cannot be overestimated, impossible to over, overestimate. And the Obama administration uh, has come a long way on this road and in this, in this area. And they really deserve commendation for this. I know the administration's been getting beaten up on a number of issues, Ukraine. I've done some of the beating up with myself on that, on that issue. But I think here there's something really important to note. If you go back to uh, uh, the, the debate back in the fall of 2009. I talked a little bit about this yesterday, but I'm going to talk about it a little bit more in a pointed way today. The debate about Afghanistan and American engagement in Afghanistan in 2009. Um, at that time, I was following it very closely because we were working on a project here at CSIS that looked at the challenges and the opportunities of the Northern Distribution Network, how we supply our troops in theater with non-lethal non -lethal supplies. Really, really interesting project which kind of led us to thinking about a regional economic cooperation strategy for Afghanistan. But at that time, the debate was, it was so narrow. It was pretty much all about counterinsurgency or counterterrorism. How many troops? That was about it. And I, the first question I asked to myself was, you know, whatever success that we, with our allies, the Afghans, have on the battlefield, if there's not economic development and economic sustainability, it's going to fall apart. And, and then to look into, well, how much thinking had been going on since 2001 about, on our side, about this piece, about an economic strategy for Afghanistan. And it was almost criminal how little strategic thinking had been done. Uh, I think in 2009, 2010, I got a, a document that had been uh, produced by the State Department about Afghan and Af economic strategy for Afghanistan, and I looked at it. It was about four pages. It was a list. It was a list. It was a list of you know 26, 27 good things. They're all good things, but there's no prioritization. There was no sense of how these work together. Uh, and even when the there there was some debate about an economic strategy, it was typically well. We should focus on agriculture. No, we should focus more on the mineral and energy wealth of Afghanistan. And the wise rabbi, both things are good. I mean, Afghanistan has to have both of these areas of their economy developed in very, in very big ways. But then another piece that was not, was not thought of that much at the time was, well, how do these, if these products, whatever they are, if they're not able to get, to get to markets, they don't have value. They don't have value. So you have to think about the transit piece of this. How, how do they get 
to other places in Afghanistan, and then even more importantly, how do they get to places outside of Afghanistan and inside of Afghanistan? And then you think, well, have the Afghans been thinking about this? Absolutely the Afghans have been thinking about this. You could go back and look at the first Afghan national development strategies. I think the first draft produced in 2000, 2006, and it was very clear that this was a high priority for them. Um, why? Because <clears throat> if there's greater trade, investment, transit connectivity of Afghanistan with its neighbors, you essentially create mutual dependencies. And you give countries an investment in Afghanistan's successful development and prosperity. Both sides benefit. It's sort of obvious, but it's not something that was you know, given, given a lot of focus in, in, in our thinking about a, about a strategy. And so at the time, uh, myself and some others here at CSIS and uh, Fred Starr over at uh, Sais Catchy we had produced uh, a report that came out in uh, just before the Kabul conference in 2010. I'm sorry, I'm repeating a little bit, a little bit of this from yesterday, but these presentations got me excited because <laughs> I think I think what's going on is really important. Um, and it was a, a modestly titled uh, "A Modern Silk Road Strategy: uh, The Key to Success in Afghanistan." Um, and it. Uh, and to see some of these projects, like TAPI that we talked about yesterday, and to see CASA 1000 or CASA RAM, and now a newer project, the 2TAP, uh, that are actually moving, moving ahead. You know, we'll see about a TAPI. But a, a positive sign that we heard about yesterday was that Bangladesh wants to join, wants to join the project. They've submitted an application. They're negotiating with Turkmenistan. So maybe it'll be called uh, TAPIB um, if, it, uh, if, it, if, it gets, if it gets done. But there's, so there's been a tremendous amount of progress, real progress that's been done. And I think in particular, to the, for the, when I look at the, what the Obama administration is doing with kind of the evolution of the new Silk Road, uh, what was called a vision. I was disappointed at that time because, well, you know, when Secretary Clinton talked about this in Chennai in uh, July of 2011, I thought that was great. Okay, someone's taking it. Ah, but they're only calling it a vision. They call it a strategy, or they call it a, an initiative. And it sounds like they're, they're really a little more committed to it. And so to hear uh, uh, Fatima today talk about it in terms of an, of an initiative, that uh, that to me uh, is it indicates uh, the reality that things are getting concretely done uh, and having an impact on the ground. I mean, that is what is going to win the hearts and minds of uh, of of people. And just a, a last comment before I ask a couple of questions of the of the panelists. Um, you know, to put this in an even broader geopolitical uh, um, context uh, we, that we've been working on here at CSIS, uh, we call Reconnecting of Eurasia. Um, we, have a, we made a big presentation at the November Global Security Forum here about that. It's up on, up on the website. If anyone's interested, we're happy to point you in that, in that direction. But, uh, I mean, one of the reasons why I got so interested in this kind of before the Northern Distribution Network project and all of that, six years ago, was seeing this graphic of satellite, uh, a satellite graphic of telecommunications activity around the world. It had been classified, it was done in 1999, and it was sort of, we sort of looked at that as a, as a metaphor for human activity and connectivity. And if you go around the entire Northern Hemisphere, it's black, with the exception of one spot, and the black meaning that there's a lot of activity going on. And that one fairly empty spot, well, guess where it is? Right here, as Fatima was saying, one of the least integrated regions of the world amongst themselves. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. Jeff and I were just traveling in, in Central Asia uh, last month. Well, now it's, no, it's in April, six weeks ago. Um, and we had, to, we had to fly, or we wanted to fly, for example, from, uh, from Tashkent to Ashgabat. And there are no direct flights between Tashkent and Ashgabat. It's going, are you kidding? Really? Two capitals within Central Asia? I mean, so the, I mean this is sort of indicative of the degree to which Central Asia, uh, the Central Asian states, has, over the course of the last 20 plus years since the collapse of the Soviet Union, as you know, Jim illustrated in his slide about how the Central Asian power system had kind of collapsed this integrated <laughs> system, there, uh, there are all indicators across the board 
about how uh, cooperation and integration had fallen off. And it, in really a sense, a, re a regional identity uh, really kind of fallen, has fallen off. And uh, there are a number of areas where it actually makes sense. It makes commercial sense. It makes uh, technical sense. It makes political sense for there to be more cooperation. And so kind of bringing this back to the point that Fado is making, uh, that projects like this are, are essentially building, enhancing patterns of cooperation within a region, between regions, in which they didn't really exist, and within regions in which there's been tremendous distrust, tremendous distrust. Uh, and as we know, talked about yesterday with the Tappy, Tappy Pipeline, I mean, you think of what this, not only what this project can do for uh, energy supply, uh, from Turkmenistan to Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India, but even potentially more importantly for the stabilization of Afghanistan, political reconciliation between Afghanistan and Pakistan, political reconciliation between India and, uh, and Pakistan, small steps in that direction. I mean, this is uh, a reason why I am personally very excited to see this, this happening. And, and it, it puts this region, I mean, this big continent, Eurasia, it is reconnecting, you know, with uh, transit lines, you know, from east to west to north, north and south diagonally. I mean, they're happening as we speak. They have been happening. It's of tremendous importance. But for the prosperity of these countries in, that have been relatively disconnected, for their prosperity, for their stability, for their for the conflict reduction, things like this are absolutely essential. So. Congratulations uh, to uh, the administration, the two banks, the institutions for the work that's been done. But you know what? You got a lot more to do. Um, two quick questions uh, before I open it up to the uh, the audience. Uh, one, I wanted to ask about Iran. Um, Iran, I saw on the slides, is still is power is providing uh, uh, electricity to Western uh, parts of Afghanistan. Um, is Iran or could Iran con be considered uh, as part of this integrated um, two-tap? Could we be talking about I2TAP or two-tappy or something like that in the future? And the second question um, gets at, you could talk a little bit more about the commercial viability of the projects because uh, if they're not commercially, commercially viable, then that's probably going to torpedo them in the long term. So if you can help make that case, that would be a lot of value added. Thanks. Anybody? Maybe I'll take some of those and pass over to Julie. Um, on Iran, actually Iran is a net importer of electricity. Uh, Turkmenistan um, withdrew from CAPS. Uh, operate synchronously now. It's an interconnected, uh, interconnected with the Iranian system, big system, and it exports to its to Iran. Uh, it, Iran is Turkmenistan's main electricity client at this moment. Even though there is some supply from Iran to the west of Afghanistan, Herat, uh, it is small, and uh, in terms of. Um, Iran being a major electricity supplier to Afghanistan, this is not expected in the, in, in the near future. <coughs> the commercial um, uh, projects, um, certainly um, Julie should, should pick up on uh, CASA, I, I guess, to, to, to that question. As far as, um, as, far as TUTAP is concerned, the, um, the, <coughs> the import uh, uh, contracts, um, of course, are the, the commercial uh, agreements are covered by import contracts, by power purchase and sales agreements. So, for example, between Tajikistan and Afghanistan, the line which was financed by Asian Development Bank, that's covered by a 20-year PPA. Um, the uh, Uzbek to um, to. Afghanistan is an annually agreed PPA, and it has been going on for the last near, nearly decade now. And the agreement between Turkmenistan and uh, Afghanistan is uh, at an advanced stage, the, the power purchase and sales agreement. 
ADB is the secretariat in facilitating the negotiations, and there have been a number of rounds of negotiations, and we expect, in fact, in the next weeks to uh, assist the countries in concluding that. So that would cover the direct bilateral agreements. Uh, when it would come to the uh, wheeling the power through to Pakistan, which is a future uh, development, at that stage, of course, Afghanistan would be in the, an opportunity to take value from its infrastructure, and, uh, but that's a future stage. But maybe Julie could, could um, I, I guess, have, have comments to add on the commercial side of CASA. Just to say that CASA has an extremely high uh, financial and economic rate of return. Uh, we, the first, when we first got the estimates back, we didn't believe them. Um, we then made the most conservative, or, you know, ran it through the most conservative assumptions, the most negative uh, scenarios, and it was robust. I mean, one of the things that strikes me is that they're all commercial agreements that actually um, govern how both how these projects work, and so. In the CASA situation, you have a situation in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, where Tajikistan, for instance, is literally spilling water um, right now during its peak summer months, where it's getting zero cents per kilowatt hour because it's spilling water. Um, if, if these four countries are able to come to agreement on the pricing, for instance, you have a situation where not only will, will Kyrgyzstan sell at a higher rate, what, you know, depending on whatever those, that, that negotiation comes to, but Afghanistan also benefits because it now generates revenue um, annually from the acting as a transit country for Pakistan. Pakistan is able to import clean energy at a price that's competitive and cheaper um, than what it's getting right now on some of its domestic production. And so you have a scenario by once you have the investments from the ADB, the World Bank, the United States, other donors, um, the Islamic Development Bank, which has also been a very um, important partner with the World Bank um, and other donors that are looking at putting money into the, uh, the, the pieces of this project, they're sustaining because they're commercial agreements. And that's why these countries ultimately, it's not just about the geopolitics, it's not just about uh, self-interest, it's because they're, they're going to make money off the deal or they're going to be importing at clean energy um, at a competitive rate where they're actually uh, able to do that. And so it, it's actually an economically very attractive package, I think, if you're able to get the different geopolitical pieces together to do. Making money is good. Okay, please, uh, uh, call on you, uh, identify yourself, and one question, comment, please, per, per person. Grant Smith. <coughs> uh, Central Asia Caucasus Institute, but for, formerly with the State Department in, Tur in Tajikistan and before that in Central South Asia. Um, I have a quick comment and a question. The quick comment is that uh, certainly when I was in Tajikistan, I recognized the importance of this kind of a project, uh, not only giving Tajikistan an opportunity to export its power, uh, but also, Mr. Liston, you commented on the interconnection between Turkmenistan and Tajikistan to provide power in the winter, which would be very important for the people of Tajikistan uh, and gets away from the issues in the Tajikistan-Uzbekistan relationship. Uh, so it has a, an additional importance there. And I also noted that there was no mention of the contentious uh, Rogun hydroelectric <laughs> project. Uh, my, my question concerns the experience that uh, the bank, the two banks have had in doing major infrastructure projects in major energy infrastructure projects in Afghanistan in a time of security problems, uh, which is certainly going to be a determinant in whether this can go forward or not. Has, have these projects uh, successfully gone ahead? Has it been necessary or possible to get local regional powers within Afghanistan a sense of buy-in for the project, that they are benefiting from it. Uh, and I say this uh, from my background in Tajikistan in the late 80s, late 90s, excuse me, um, when we noted that narcotics trafficking continued in spite of uh, very difficult situations within Afghanistan. And our, theory was that the people there always saw, well, war is war, but business is business. 
and the trafficking continued. Can you persuade people to have that kind of an approach to major infrastructure projects as well? Okay, since Grant did mention the R word, Rogan Dam, uh, I was wondering if you could also just uh, highlight that part of the question. Jeff and I were in the three downstream countries, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan, and of course we heard a lot about, about it, and I was wondering if you, in addition to his question, could you address kind of your perspective on, on uh, that issue? Thanks. Well, I can deal with some of the issues on the the, bashful Irishman. the, the, the Afghan infrastructure and uh, the, the regional uh, buy-in uh, on, on the Rogun. I, I think maybe that might be uh, a, a, a World Bank uh, <laughs> comment who, who is currently um, working on, on that, project. that project. Um, ADB has financed a number of projects in, in Afghanistan which I've mentioned earlier on. And um, I, some years ago, it was more difficult to receive bids from consultants and contractors. We did get bids. We did, get, we did award contracts. We, there are consultants working there. But the range of, uh, of, of bids was, was low. That has actually um, improved, improved substantially. There are more more consultants, more more contractors. Um, I mentioned the the interconnection with Turkmenistan that the bids are under evaluation right now. In, in, indeed, the client has um, concluded their um, evaluation and sent it to ADB for our no objection. And we're very pleased to see a um, a, a, a long list of of contractors who are who are interested in in uh, working. That's one stage of the uh, of the the project. The next stage, then, of course, is do the projects stay standing? Um, have they been attacked? Uh, and the answer is a very clear no. That um, contrary to um, all expectations you might have otherwise, the <coughs> the thirst, the demand from the population for electricity is is um, unbelievable. Um, or maybe you could believe it if you were in a country with no electricity and you could imagine what life is like. So um, the population want this so much. And, um, you know, uh, there have been no uh, experiences of sabotage with any of the existing assets that we've, we've uh, put up and touch wood, yeah. And uh, so all indications are good in, in that regard. Regarding regional buy-in, um, uh, <clears throat> ADB did conduct a, a, a study also on our website, also a thousand pages again when you finished the first uh, master plan, and it's um, a very uh, interesting uh, report which shows that if the, let's say the four, at this stage there's only uh, four countries involved, if the four Central Asian republics <laughs> Um, re-engaged in energy trade, if they went back to what they were doing in during the Soviet era, that the uh, savings per annum were are, are calculated at 1.6 billion U US dollars. <coughs> so it sounds good. Um, now, um, but the savings are not evenly distributed. There are winners and there are losers, and the losers naturally are not so keen. And in fact, um, this is not an irrational approach that when you look at the experience throughout the world, including here in US, um, uh, losers do not like to join in, in, um, in regional um, experiences, even if the overall uh, result is, is a win. There is also the issue of energy security. So if you're Tajikistan and you, um, you are in winter energy deficit and you're dependent on supply from your neighbors, that weakens your, your position and uh, countries are worried about that. And it's not only Central Asia, again, this is every country in the world views energy uh, security as a, a top issue. So ADB believes that once countries achieve some um, level of energy security when they become confident with their 
with their own energy security, then they will get involved in energy trade. So this is our experience that, um, that countries first want to protect their, their, their uh, sovereignty and, and then take advantage from energy trade. So that's the step that we're, we're seeing. Thank you. <coughs> uh, okay, well, I'm glad I got the easy question. Um, so whatever happens with Rogan, CASA will not take power from Rogan. That's, that's the simple answer. I'm the South Asia person, so I'm not going to talk about Rogan <coughs> itself. Um, I would second um, what Jim was saying about the security issues, and also to say that um, the, the project builds in a huge amount of community benefit, what we call community benefit sharing, because the days of power systems, you know, going over the head of local people and providing no benefits to those local people are, are over. Um, so we've got huge investments in making sure that there is very specific local area development in the, li in the areas where the lines will be going. Um, and the Afghan government has shown huge support for, um, for the CASA project um, con consistently. Uh, so I think the, the idea of you know, it being a major transit country is very appealing to it above and beyond the financial rewards that it will get from in being involved in the project. Hi, my name is Melissa Crawford, and I'm a Ringel Fellow with the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. And I had a question about Turkey and whether Turkey has expressed any interest in joining uh, this particular, or being involved with this particular initiative at all. Um, I know that it's been a little bit blocked out from the EU, also the Middle East, and some people see Turkey with its linguistic ties to Central Asia as kind of being one of the best or even last resorts for them to grow their economy. And I was, so you talked about India a little bit and how they were interested in joining this initiative somehow. Does Turkey come in at all with this? Thank you. <coughs> Actually, um, uh, Turkmenistan uh, exports to um, Armenia and on to Turkey um, via Iran. Um, they use the, they have a, a commercial agreement with Iran to wheel, I mean, actually how it works is that they supply the um, eastern part of Iran and the western part of Iran supplies uh, to Turkey. So there is some um, Central Asia to, to Turkey trade or to the west trade, but it's, um, it's, it's limited, it's, it's not the focus of this particular initiative we're looking more north south, but it um, there is from Central Asia, uh, f from Turkmenistan via Iran, and also in the west um, west Central Asia, if you, if you could uh, or think of s such a term, uh, the Caucasus and um, Georgia, which I mentioned, <coughs> also a, an ATP country, um, hydro rich and uh, it is um, exporting to, to Turkey via a HVDC back-to-back -back converter station, for your information. Thank you. Yeah, they've also expressed interest in, in the CASA project, so that's under discussion now. Well, and I think if we, if we put it in a, a, somewhat, a somewhat broader perspective in thinking about, <coughs> uh, I mean, Turkey has been a big supporter of a regional economic cooperation strategy for Afghanistan. Um, and the RECA process, uh, they, the uh, Regional Economic Cooperation uh, Conference uh, for Afghanistan uh, meetings. Uh, I attended one of them in 2010 uh, in Istanbul. Of course, we have the Istanbul process. So in Turkey, understanding well, because it is a transit state itself, has further aspirations of being a, tra a transit hub, uh, has ethnic, religious, uh, cultural connections and interests in Central Asia. You know, for all of these reasons, I think they are uh, big in supporting this in, in principle and, and various various pieces of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, good morning. I'm Malbohori Mamlo from The Voice of America. 
um, enjoying listening to all of you. Uh, Fatima Sumar, you sound very optimistic. It's great <laughs> to feel your energy. But when we talk to the people in the region, to the folks, to the officials in the region, they're not as optimistic. I mean, the, this government has been talking about the Silk Road vision now, Silk Road initiative, and CASA and other projects for a long time. But do you really see a real progress in terms of how these governments are now approaching these um, projects? Because, I mean, do you see any collaboration between the countries of Central Asia? Are they discussing this issue as actively as Washington is discussing, for example? Because when we look at state media, we hardly see any reports about them. I mean, the, the names of these projects pop up when US officials visit the region, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So, if you could sure. answer that. Um, you. So, you know, one of the reasons why I personally am so optimistic about this is when you think about the New Silk Road initiative from the United States, it's not a U.S. driven initiative in the sense of um, us telling countries in the region what they're going to do, what they're going to work on. Actually, it's the opposite of that. We are taking our cues in our direction from the conversations we have with governments, with civil society, with, with the private sector, with the international community, donors, about what the possibilities are and where governments are interested in actually using political capital and doing things. And so if you look at the four different pil pillars that I identified in my, in my remarks, in each of these areas, there are different areas where you've seen real collaboration and partnership. And those are the areas we're pursuing. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, Obviously, on the regional energy side with CASA, you have for the first time ongoing active discussions between the governments of Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. That was not happening in the recent past. And for the first time, you see this, you see this monthly, you see this weekly, the phone calls, the, the meetings, the, the schedules all over, um, all over to, uh, the world to look at how to reach the next stage of deals on pricing, on the commercial agreements, and to move the project forward. When you look at uh, the trade and transit side, there are ongoing conversations that are happening in the region on cross-border trade agreements, for instance. So if you look at um, the Kyrgyzstan, Afghanistan, um, uh, uh, Tajikistan uh, frame there in terms of the different cross-border agreements that are there, there's the, the CBTA currently in the parliament in Bishkek, for instance, which is awaiting ratification that would really improve cross-border trade and transit in this region. These are ongoing conversation between these governments of the region. If you look at the work that's being done on customs and borders, for instance, to strengthen the border points in Afghanistan's checkpoints and, and streamline trade and transit conversations. For the first time with US support, for instance, you have um, training in, in Tajikistan where we're bringing Afghan mm -hmm. customs and borders officials to Tajikistan to look at cross-border security and training and cooperation. Uh, you have officials from Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Afghanistan meeting on various projects and in ways, whether um, it's through the U.S. programs, OSCE programs, or EU border security programs. Um, if you look at the people-to-people the -people pillar I mentioned, it is remarkable to look at the network of women entrepreneurs that for the first time has been created linking Central Asian women entrepreneurs and South Asian women entrepreneurs. And for the first time, you have networks of women in each of these countries who not only are connected to each other, but are giving via SMS, text, email support on a daily basis, support, advice, and guidance to their counterparts in different countries about how to break through what can be very difficult investment climates how to get access to capital, how to start a new business, how to grow an SME into a much broader business and sector. It is remarkable to me in every single one of these areas how much is happening every single day um, and how much is not being captured by media in general because the conversation in the lens tends to be very negative on the challenges and the problems. And yet the opportunities and what, what the, the success stories that we've had have been so remarkable in each of these areas. When you look at um, conversations on WTO, for instance, which is really, you know, you think a lot about the investments that have to be made on the infrastructure side, and sure, you need to build roads and bridges and tunnels and the physical infrastructure, but at the end of the day, without the soft infrastructure, without the regulatory infrastructure that would complement that, the truck is still, whether the road is there or not, it's not able to cross that border and, and not able to move. When you look at the statistics I mentioned in the earlier part of my remarks, about interregional trade and the border crossing times decreasing in such a significant way. Those are real success stories. That doesn't happen because the United States comes in. That happens because there's real cooperation and movement amongst the governments in the region to streamline their procedures and to work together. 
what, what I think is striking of what's happening is, of course, there's going to be progress in areas where governments see a real self-interest, and it's in their own national interest, and they feel that they're, it, it's not at a, at a um, cost to them in terms of their own national security to make these kind of connections and make these kinds of projects real. Where, where governments are not interested, you're not going to see them necessarily part of those projects or part of those collaborations. So it's not, um, it's not a situation where you need all five Central Asian countries on all five projects, for instance. Another area which, is, uh, uh, which I really want to stress, and you know, we mentioned this in the energy context because it's so important, is just water management and water sharing issues in these countries and the types of conversations that really have and collaborations that have to take place on transboundary water management issues. And if you look at the work that's even been done um, in, in, in this context of countries coming together for the first time you have in, with, through the UN auspices, for instance, conversations in Vienna and in other places where all five Central Asian countries are coming to the table to talk about how to do water sharing agreements. That was not happening for so many years. So there is a real sense, I think, in certain <coughs> sectors and certain areas of where, of where movement needs to happen. Now, again, I want to underscore and emphasize that this is one of the hardest regions in the world to work when, you, when it comes to interregional connections for all the many reasons that we've laid out earlier in our presentations today. Progress is not necessarily linear. It's going to take time. These are generational challenges in many ways, and so there's no quick wins here in terms of um, looking at two years from now, what can we say we've accomplished in turn, and, then, and then pulling away. This is going to be a long-term commitment, a long-term partnership from the United States and from other countries, and working not just with governments, but with people of the region and civil society and strengthening those capacities so that you have a real long-term generational solution to a lot of these challenges. Just to add to that, because I see, I see tremendous progress uh, in thinking about this. And that there, countries uh, are increasingly thinking of their role as transit hubs. A country like Turkmenistan, for example, I mean, traditionally quite closed, isolated, or seemingly, seemingly to us, there are tremendous things afoot in how they are thinking about themselves, not just thinking about themselves as, as, a, as a transit hub, but actually doing things. For example, a new railroad that's being built uh, uh, linking Kazakh, the Western Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and Iran. It's, uh, nearly, it's nearly completed. This is an important project for these states to be able to have access to, <coughs> uh, to, uh, uh, to the Persian Gulf and to, and to, and to sea trade, essential for landlocked, landlocked countries uh, uh, like them. And there are lots of things, things like that. So it's, and it's, so it's, you know, the, what, in a way, I think it's like the United States has joined in with uh, what is just a growing momentum of connectivity uh, and the importance of connectivity and people understanding that, you know, our prosperity is going to depend to a cons considerable extent on our being connected uh, in these larger uh, energy, uh, transit, trade uh, routes, uh, etc. They will they will lose they will lose out and they'll they will lose out lose out badly. Um, it's uh, and it's not a uh, and is not a short term progress a pro process. And the biggest obstacle, as uh, Fatima is saying, you know, it's not the lack of physical infrastructure that's a problem. It's not the security issue. It's basically the uh, the long standing problem of borders acting as toll booths. Uh, and, and stopping it, you know, sea trade is uh, is so dominant because it's very, 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 very predictable. Um, the problem with transcontinental or land land trade is that is the unpredictability of uh, when the product's going to arise and just what the cost will be incurred as it has to cross several borders. So I think that that uh, um, uh, the data point that Fatima brought, you know, a regional 15 percent drop uh, in the time. Uh, which it takes to, to cross borders is really, really significant, but it takes tremendous effort on all fronts over a long period of time to push that back because what you're basically fighting against uh, are, are, are politics uh, and interest groups uh, which are not necessarily acting uh, in the interests of what one might conceive of as the national interest, so to speak. Hi, my name is David Keith, and I'm with Tetra Tech, and I'm going to pose this to you, Julia, 
because you said you're the South Asia person. <laughs> First, I want to compliment everybody. This is just fantastic to see Casa Rem, Tutap, and Casa 1000 all on the same panel, all on the same page. This is like a dream come true for those of us who've worked in this region in the energy sector for as long as I have. The one thing I haven't heard anybody talk about really is the demand side, mm -hmm. and that's Pakistan. And I think we, uh, those of us who are working there know that Pakistan has a tremendous circular debt problem in its energy sector. And I was wondering if maybe Julia might address what sort of credit enhancement and that sort of thing that would make these projects actually fly. <laughs> uh, oh, I left my thingy on, sorry. Um, well, so, so we have a, a comprehensive set of things we're trying to do in Pakistan to help, oh, at the government's request, to help them deal with the energy crisis. And we actually have the country director for uh, Pakistan um, in the room, so I will ask him to compliment what I'm saying if you have any additional questions. Um, but we have, so we have a combination of things. The, the, the sort of uh, underpinning is a, what we call a policy loan. So we're working with... Um, with the government on various policy reforms, which then um, we can finance some of the government's spending once those reforms are completed. And we have a series of those policy loans ongoing. The first one's already completed. Um, and circular debt, as you can imagine, is a very, very serious part of that, uh, of that policy dialogue. But then we also have some public investment and significant private investment to bring down the average cost of power. Because right now, as I said at the beginning, they're highly dependent on um, imp very expensive imported fuel. And um, so if we can develop some of the hydropower projects, that brings down the average cost of power dramatically. Um, in addition, r working at some of the inefficiencies and the tariff, the tariff uh, setting and the tariff. Um, so the inefficiencies in the system, the losses, the tariff um, structure and the collections, um, and also a lot of issues on governance and transparency. Um, yeah, I mean, it's clearly there's, there's multiple problems, but, but we also know from a political economy point of view, you can't fix um, any power system or any utility system just by putting up the price and increasing collections. If the service is poor, people's willingness to pay is not, is not good. So one has to work in tandem improving trust in the system, improving reliability of the system, and improving the cost recovery of the system. And do you want to add anything, Rashid? No. Hi, Gary Sargent. Um, I run a small little consulting firm called Treadstone Light. I'm a, as a retired Army Special Forces guy, I'm a little disturbed by the counterinsurgency piece. So I just want to make one thing clear, because he mentioned it, that we don't do counterinsurgency anymore. Counterinsurgency entails the whole, well, I, but, but anyways. So I'll leave that alone. But um, what I would like to sort of hear about from the panel is um, energy production in Afghanistan. Thoughts on that? Because I heard the word coal earlier, and that sort of disturbs me to hear that as one of the generation things we're going to use in Afghanistan. So. Yeah, thank you. Um, Afghanistan <clears throat> today has hydro and diesel. That's it's about 500 megawatts, about half and half. It's um, hydro is summer only, seasonal. Its peak demand is in winter. Diesel is expensive. The population cannot afford it. Um, the resources available to uh, Afghanistan to build its own domestic generation are coal, gas, and hydro. <clears throat> um, I'm aware that World Bank is assisting in Kunar, which is a significant major hydro project. ADB is assisting, along with USAID, in uh, gas um, gas generation, Shevigan gas gas generation. I guess that can be counted as clean. Uh, coal um, associated with the INAC uh, copper um, uh, mine concession, because uh, Afghanistan is also mineral rich. This is one of its opportunities to, to grow iron ore, uh, copper, 
gems, uh, rare earth metals. So naturally it wants to develop that. And so it has a concession, a private concession, uh, Chinese consortium who are developing the uh, Anyak copper mine and associated with that, they will need uh, both uh, in-house captive uh, supply and they are exporting. That is a coal plant and a thermal plant. Um, so Afghanistan is, um, needs a dispatchable plant to meet its, um, its, its winter uh, demand. And it is uncomfortable to continue its high level of dependency on imports for perfectly reasonable and understandable reasons. It wishes to decrease that, so it wishes to build its own its own supply, and it is doing that uh, through through the private sector as as best as it can. Um, so, I guess that's it. That answers your your question. Just a clarification: It's Naglu. Um, we're, we're financing the rehabilitation of Naglu in, in Afghanistan. Kunar is just at the water sharing, uh, water analysis stage. So we're not doing any. Um, and um, I should have said in my answer about Pakistan that this is another case where um, the ADB and the World Bank are completely in lockstep. I mean, they never, they never, I mean, they finish each other's sentences, the two team members, and they never go to a meeting without each other and haven't since the beginning. It's been the most, uh, the closest cooperation I think I've ever seen. So uh, I just forgot to mention that. Thanks. It's a really important point, though. I think just to what uh, Jim was saying in reference to to INAC, or we said it the same would apply to uh, to Hajikok, uh, some of the huge mineral resource basins in Afghanistan. Uh, there's uh, they will never get developed unless you have uh, power delivered there uh, to start to start things, and then obviously you also have to have railroad there as well to to export export it out. Uh, you can't do it economically with trucks. Um, and so these are also uh, pieces of plans of, of various various other projects for the development of Afghanistan and its uh, inter interconnectivity. Um, I think we may have time for uh, one last uh, question or, or, or comment before we wrap things up. Uh, but it looks like everyone is fully satiated uh, with all of the information today. So let me, uh, uh, before I thank everybody, let me make an, uh, an advertisement because next week uh, we will be hosting a related discussion uh, to, uh, in ways to, to Eurasian cooperation and development here on uh, on June 11th, uh, and this will be uh, the discussion will be on multilateral uh, security and development challenges in Asia and what is the role for SICA, uh, the conference uh, on interaction and confidence building in Asia, uh, and this institution just held their. Uh, last, most recent, their fourth summit meeting a couple of weeks, weeks ago in, uh, in Shanghai. We have a terrific program for that on June 11th on, uh, on, the, on the morning. Unfortunately, I will not be there because Jeff uh, Mankoff and I will be taking off uh, tonight for Baku, uh, Tbilisi, and Yerevan. So I'm very happy to get this data point, uh, Jim, about the, uh, the Turkmen, Armenian, uh, uh, Iran, Turkey uh, connection. But let me uh, thank uh, uh, Julia uh, and Jim uh, for uh, pinch hitting brilliantly today in our discussion of uh, TUTAP and uh, CASA 1000 and a, a large and special thanks to Fatima for uh, bringing the administration's perspective uh, on these projects and uh, what the U.S. government is doing to help, uh, help advance them. And uh, if I can just wish you all personally continued uh, success and look forward to gathering in the next uh, months and years and uh, hearing how the progress has, uh, has been furthered. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.